When you're unhappy with your cooking results, maybe it's not your fault. Maybe it's actually your tongue's fault. You'll find out how to train your tongue to improve your cooking today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. This is the free public weekly show for the methods, the techniques, the insights into better food and cooking. We're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern right here on my Chef Todd Moore page on Facebook. This is a free class open to the public so you can share it with as many people as you'd like. And if you would like a private email reminder of when I'm going live, you can sign up at webcookingclasses.com slash live. If you want to see what I'm cooking and have me tell you how I did it, then follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well. Here is the best pizza I have ever made. I have made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of best pizzas. This is the best pizza I have made. And I'll tell you that why because I used uh, chopped tomatoes instead of tomato sauce. Hey, I don't know how I think these things up. Maybe it's because I'm a carefree cook. I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together. I learn every time I cook. I create my own cooking style because I practice pro methods and I love my cooking. And I'll tell you what else I love. I love being live with you on Tuesdays for the Carefree Cooks Code. I missed everybody so terribly. Um, I've been moving for the past week and I'm in my new office, very echoey office as you can see. Um, nothing on the walls yet, things in boxes over here. Uh, anyone that has moved, and now it's the second time that I've moved in a year, knows how terrible it is. My hands are all cut up from cardboard and things like that. Ah, but I'm back at it today and I'm thrilled. So we're going to be doing all kinds of new cool stuff. The cool new location that I'm in is going to bring us new food. I just, I have so much stuff. <laughs> so much more to tell you about it and to try and get rid of the echo in here as well once I get the office set up and I'm not in this blank void. But when I do start pulling this great food out of the water uh, right in front of me, we are going to ask the question, what goes with that? What goes with that fish? What goes with that crab? What goes with clams? What goes with what? And it's a topic that I've been delving into deeply lately in my Carefree Cooks Insiders Cooking Club lately. Um, actually, we did a series of four classes on this very topic last month. It's a question that's most asked of me <laughs> and most often used as an excuse, I think, for not starting your own cooking journey. What goes with what? Does this go with that? Well, I give up. I can't possibly be a good cook if I don't know what goes with what, right? Please tell me what goes with chicken. Please tell me what goes with rosemary and tarragon. Anytime your brain is asking what goes with what, it's really asking the question of your tongue, no? I mean, the brain thinks it's the head, but really your tongue is the head in what goes with what. The brain is never going to figure out what tastes good without the tongue or the nose for that matter, but that's another day. You know, come to think of it, when it comes to cooking and figuring out what flavors you like or uh, repairing a dish, right, that didn't come out right, 
the brain, it's really not as smart as the tongue and the nose. And I'm going to show you how to train your tongue to tell your brain what goes with what today. But first, I've got a what am I? Here it is. It is something that has been magnified 90 times. 90 times magnification on the what am I? Tell me what am I in the comments section below, please. Now, one of the reasons that I really look forward to Tuesdays at noon is because it's my weekly opportunity to pay it back. And that's the way I think about this because you know I was just like you, right? I was a frustrated home cook who really liked to cook, thought I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. <laughs> there were a few things that I thought I knew what I was doing, but when I started really learning, I realized I didn't. And I could repeat a few recipes. Um, uh, like I can repeat a few words in French, right? Or like I can play chopsticks on the, on the piano. Ding, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Well, look, the truth is I don't speak French. I don't play the piano but I can give you a little taste of both every once in a while. You know, when you know just enough to be dangerous, that's the way I was with cooking, with French, with all of those things, just a little bit. You know, like in French, I, I spoke Pepe Le Pew French is the way it was. it was. Oh, monsieur, oh, monsieur, come with me to the Casbah. Uh, yeah, uh, that cartoon hasn't aged well. <laughs> As, I mean, he was constantly sexually harassing that cat, right? Hashtag me too, Pepe. Get with the times. All right. But that's where my cooking was 25 years ago. I was faking it. I was cooking like I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know what I was doing. Kind of like speaking French, like Pepe Le Pew, like a cartoon character. All fun to do. <laughs> it's fun to talk like Pepe Le Pew, but... The results are disappointing. It's fun to cook randomly and just cross your fingers that the recipe is going to come out, but the results are terrible. Things would go wrong in my cooking and I never knew how to fix it. Well, you all know what happened from there, right? I took some extreme measures and honestly, I became a little obsessed <laughs> and I still am with figuring out how cooking works and then sharing it with you. So obsessed for 27 years over cooking is what you really call obsessed. And it's the same amount of time uh, that Heather and I have been together. She, of course, my, my greatest obsession. Because it's funny, the difference between those two photos, huh? That one <laughs> and, and, and that one. Yeah, in front of the Moulin Rouge. Look, <laughs> I didn't realize how much like Pepe I really was. Look, because I wish someone had shared some of these things with me, some of the things that I've learned when, since I was that frustrated home cook, that's why I really want to share them with you because I have taken the same path that you're on. I just became a certified culinary educator and a huge volume chef, and it's really all because I wanted to cook dinner for Heather. But one of the things that I really didn't understand back then, and the point of today is the idea of what goes with what. And I thought back then, as maybe you do now, that if you just find that perfect combination, right, that, that perfect thing that's written in order in the recipe, the perfect combination of ingredients, of spices, everything will come out fine, right? Because you can't just put Old Bay hot sauce on, on everything and call it a masterpiece. That's what I tried to do. <laughs> Learning cooking in Baltimore, put Old Bay on it and it's got to be good. Well, look, this ignores the methods of cooking. And whenever you ignore the methods of cooking, it's a disaster waiting to happen. The methods always come first. Dependable, repeatable ways of cooking. But then, once you know your cooking is good, then you examine how do you know what goes with what? And how do you know how to fix a dish that doesn't taste the way you thought it would. This is one of the greatest skills in the kitchen. Anybody can drive into a brick wall and just disaster. It's the people that know how to put it back together. It's, it's called the Humpty Dumpty theory. No, he fell off the wall. Nonetheless, the secret of all this is right on your tongue because Western culture says that there are four tastes on your palate. 
And actually, your palate is the roof of your mouth. It's the upper surface of the mouth. It's everything that separates the oral and nasal cavities. You don't actually taste anything on the roof of your mouth because most of the receptors are found on your tongue. But the word palate sounds a lot fancier than cavity, <laughs> doesn't it? Pa yeah, palate's a better, oh, here's a discerning cavity. Yeah, because palate's always used as a descriptive term, right? A person with an expensive palate only likes high-priced culinary treats. Someone who tastes slight nuances in food is said to have a well-developed palate. And someone who likes only fancy food is said to have a, a sophisticated palate. But if you're talking about your palate, you're, you're making a generalization, a judgment about yourself and or the food that you choose to eat. And look, I'm not as concerned about your palate as I am in your ability to perceive the differences in flavors in your cooking. That's the point today. We can call it palate if it makes you feel better, but I want you to talk about your tongue and what goes on on your tongue. And we trace, just to take a step back, we trace this idea of definable and categorizable senses in your mouth all the way back to Aristotle, around 350 BC, who cited sweet, bitter, succulent, salt, pungent, harsh, puckery, and sour as the basic taste, the first time that we came to this concept. The ancient Chinese brought these ideas down to just five elements, bitter, salty, sour, sweet, and spicy. Japanese adds umami, which is meatiness or savoriness, and every other culture adds a description of taste that's appropriate or needed in their particular culture, right? So for many years, the books on the physiology of human taste contain these diagrams. You've seen this before. The diagram of the tongue showing the levels of sensitivity to different tastes in different regions in your tongue. This is what you were taught of as kids, or you had the Rolling Stones album and you just put two and two together, I guess. But look, it's not true. This whole, this whole taste map thing, it's not true. And it's way too easy to disprove. Tastes are found in all areas of the tongue, not, not this popular map that everyone has seen. It's like saying I can only feel uh, heat on my elbow. I, I, don't, I don't feel any heat on my fingers. Or, I mean, you, you feel heat everywhere, right? You have all sense receptors that you need all over your body and you have all taste receptors all over your tongue. So I have two goals for today. The first is to disprove this tongue map thing. That's going to take about 30 seconds. So for the remaining time, I want to show you how to actually train your tongue so you can make adjustments to your cooking that your brain really doesn't need to be involved in. Remember, it's your tongue that's the boss. It's your tongue that's going to tell your brain what goes with what, not the other way around. And the reason that I can never really answer that question about what goes for what with what for somebody is because it's entirely personal. You need to figure out what goes with what in your mouth, not mine. And once you figure that out, then you can start to create. You create new dishes based on these flavor combinations that you perceive and you now have the ability to recover a dish that doesn't taste right by changing your tongue's perception of the dish. Are you with me? This is kind of high level stuff that we teach last semester in culinary school. So you're sticking with me on this or are you sticking out your tongue? <laughs> All right, well, good. Uh, let me, let's do a quick exercise. All right, what I have here, I have some sugar. I have some salt. I have coffee beans, bitter, and some bitter uh, greens, and lime uh, for a sour. So I've got representations of the four senses. And according to the tongue map, I'm only supposed to taste saltiness on the front side of my tongue. So let's get to it. Take some saltiness, and I'm going to put it on the middle of my tongue. <laughs> yeah, still salty. Right? So, okay, there you go. I told you I could disprove that in 30 seconds. If I don't put the salt on the side of my tongue, it still tastes like salt. So let's move on. Um, we could spend a little bit more time with the salt um, and the lime, um, but then I'd have to go get some tequila 
and I guarantee the results will not be the same. <laughs> um, I'll taste sweet, sour, salty, and bitter no matter where you put the food item in my mouth. All right, so that whole map thing is ridiculous. The next challenge is training the tongue to recognize the four categories of each. And when you have too much of one, how to add something else to counteract it, okay? So the first thing we need to do is convince the brain is to tell the brain to convince the tongue that these four flavors are opposites, all right? So here's the first concept for you. Have your brain tell your tongue that these four flavors counterbalance each other. And I learned this whole concept from my friend Pascal, the spice store owner in Paris. He fed me white peppercorns from Madagascar. They were really bitter, right? They made me furrow my brow. Then he took the Galiguette French strawberry, their long torpedo strawberry. Here, quickly, taste this. And my tongue blew my brain's mind that day because as Pascal fed me one thing after the other to watch the sweet go away, the sour, the bitter, it was, it was one of the most life-changing exercises I've ever had and I've shared it with people ever since. And this whole thing is on my French Food Finds online course and DVD. And for those of you that have that course, uh, check out uh, Pascal's shop, Le Epicure Fine. I learned more about messing with my cavity, uh, sorry, palate, and sense of taste in an hour with Pascal than I did in a year of culinary school. So the guy, absolute master, forever indebted with Pascal. So inspired by Pascal, let's start your tongue training. Let's take some salt. All right, salt. Ew, salty, right? So now I'm thinking about a dish that maybe I made too salty. Maybe I used that really bad dried bouillon cube. Uh, maybe I used a condiment like soy sauce or something that's pretty salty. <laughs> Tough to speak and do this. So I want to tone this dish down. I put too much salt in the dish. So we can tone down salt with a little bit of bitter. And a lot of times this can be um, accomplished with herbs, bitter herbs, leafy herbs, thyme, tarragon, fresh, not dried. They'll help overcome the saltiness. Uh, turmeric, fresh ginger, wasabi are very bitter. And that's why so many Asian foods are even saltier than you're perceiving because of the ginger, the wasabi, the things like that. All these things hide the MSG, the bitter herbs, the vegetables, things like that. Chocolate is bitter. Um, you can use mole sauce with cocoa to overcome a salty dish. Um, I have coffee beans also that are very bit bitter. So you don't need to make your salty dish taste like coffee, but you're just trying to trick your tongue. So even a small dusting or a garnish of ground coffee can change the tongue's perception and can train it to forget about the salty taste, all right? So let's try it. Let's take a coffee bean. Suck on that for a minute. Spit it out. I'm back to normal. I don't taste any of the saltiness now, all right? So I'm back to normal. Let's cleanse the cavity a little bit. All right, so let's say you're making a tomato sauce or lemon uh, shrimp scampi dish, and, and it, it is, uh, there you go, bitter overcomes salty. You're making a lemon uh, scampi dish, you put too much lemon in it, and it's way too sour. All right, maybe your tomatoes are really acidic, uh, or you added too much lemon, and it, you know one of those kind of makes you wince when you taste it. Maybe you didn't reduce your red wine in your sauce enough and you get that very kind of acidic sour wine taste it's a common mistake it is like licking a lime okay or a lemon <laughs> or a lemon oh it's really sour okay um how about some balsamic vinegar something like that that would be in a dish it's really sour so if you want to train your tongue to stop listening to the sour message that it's sending to your brain, you need to interrupt that conversation with another message. And this is why grandma quickly, because my mouth is going crazy, this is why grandma added sugar to her tomato sauce. And away goes the sour and up comes the sweet. This is why 
Things like sweet and sour, <coughs> sour are so amazing. Excuse me. <clears throat> because they play on both of them. But grandma added sugar to her tomato sauce and so many people put sugar in their sauces today because of very bitter or sour tomatoes. So the sweet will overcome that. That's why grapefruit juice, that's why cranberry juice, pomegranate juice are sweetened. I mean, they're horribly sour otherwise. Have you ever eaten raw cranberries? Oh, they're terrible, right? So if your tomato sauce is too sour because of the acid in the tomatoes or the red wine, add something sweet. Add something naturally sweet is what I would want you to do. So instead of adding sugar to it, um, how about some steamed or poached carrots or pureed carrots? That's the secret in my uh, tomato sauce. Carrots are very sweet. You could add some honey to your sauce. You're not looking to make it a honey tomato sauce. You're just make, looking to, to bring it back to level, to balance, right? Basil is sweet. Bell peppers are sweet. Roasted garlic is sweet. These are all natural ingredients that you reply with when your tongue tells you that something is too sour, okay? So this is how you get what goes with what, or this is how you make something go with what, or this is how you uh, change a dish that went wrong. These are the four basic examples that I've shown you. Salt for salty, lime for vinegar and sour, coffee, cocoa for bitter, add sugar for sweet, right? And you have an entire pantry of these items right now that can be categorized in that way. A little bitter green. Mellows out my mouth. So categorize things, right? Get all your pantry items and, and recognize in your brain what they are. The vinegars are gonna be sour. The citruses are gonna be sour. What about some of these things you're not sure of? It's time to categorize them. It is time for your tongue and your brain to start working together <laughs> so they can repair any cooking gone wrong in the future. So what's in your cabinets? Are they salty? Are they sweet? Are they bitter? Are they sour? Taste them. Know all the condiments in, on your refrigerator door. So when something tastes too salty, you go, well, let me grab that lime juice or let me grab uh, some, uh, some honey, some maple syrup. Know these condiments because this is how you make things go with each other. Tastes and senses on the tongue are like the effects of colors for a painter, right? A painter wants you to see the contrast in his or her art. Painter doesn't paint a blue canvas. And a skilled cook wants you to taste the contrast in his or her art as well. This contrast is what makes it exciting and manipulating these flavors is the way to create something really special or how to fix a dish that's gone wrong. And often those two go together because, you know, it's really funny how often I go to fix something that's gone wrong and then I wind up creating something entirely different and something really amazing. And that's why it's a journey, my friends. It's an entire journey toward becoming truly free in the kitchen, cooking with confidence, cooking with pride, and always striving to the most carefree cooking that you can be with a reliance on the methods. So methods bring confidence, confidence brings creativity, and now with the skill to balance these four senses, one overcoming the other, that will bring you to the height of creating your own dishes. And it's just another step you can take in your cooking when you start to think about taste characteristics of the food you cook with. Not just follow the recipe, not just randomly throw things together. Don't talk like Pepe Le Pew. Know what you're doing, be confident. Because then when you have the confidence, when you have the creativity, you have the skill to manipulate flavors, then you decide what goes with what. You don't ask me, <laughs> you don't ask somebody else, you decide it. Oh, and by the way, uh, here's an aside. Um, everything I told you is no good today. Oops, wasted 25 minutes of your time, sorry. <laughs> Um, the past 25 minutes has been totally wasted and is absolutely useless. If you're not tasting your food as you cook, oh, it's another chef thing that drives me crazy. The number of people that just put stuff together and put it on the plate. 
How are you going to be able to adjust your flavors? How will you be able to make that dish better and better and better every time if you don't taste and adjust as you cook? If you are not doing this now, admit it. So many of you aren't. Taste as you go. And you know, don't ruin the entire sauce. I've, I've made this recommendation before. You get, get one of these little ramekins, right? And if you're not sure about the sauce or you're not sure of what goes with what, make yourself a basic white sauce or a velouté sauce, put a little bit in the cup and then add that condiment and taste. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, you know, peanut butter and soy sauce. No, no. Well, actually, that does, that does go pretty well together, like a satay. Um, and all right, let me put maple in instead. Let it taste. Oh, that's actually pretty good. And then you go right to the main dish. You add a little bit, but you should be tasting and adjusting as you go when you're cooking. Your 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 tongue can't tell you what to do if your tongue is on the sidelines, right? Maybe I should have thought that should go without saying that goes without saying right that you're tasting your food as you go and that's the way that you know what goes with what and how to adjust yeah speaking of which so what is this magnified photo how many of you got it it's a little bit on the nose <laughs> a little bit on the nose um that's your taste buds that's your tongue magnified 90 times look if you know someone that doesn't know how to listen to their tongue and they don't know that their cooking might be suffering because of it then you should share this video with them like it heck even love it you can give it to some stranger that you don't even know and they'll benefit from it as well oh it's here it's here as far as i'm concerned it starts now Outdoor cooking season is gearing up. I want to be ready for my best grilling, my best barbecuing and smoking this year. And I want you to be as skilled as ever this spring and summer. And that's why I'm relaunching one of my most popular spring and summer classes straight filmed from my previous backyard. It's how to fix the top three grilling mistakes for more obedient outdoor cooking. And, uh, you know, most backyard home chefs they're making at least one of these three mistakes, if not two, and many of them making all three of them. Uh, really what that means is their outdoor cooking is controlling them instead of the other way around. So go to webcookingclasses.com slash obedient to get started. Choose your class time today. Until next Tuesday, uh, where hopefully we'll have the office decorated a little better. This is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's always a method to your food pairing success. Bye everyone.